discussion is a curtain raiser for the more elaborate account of mass nationalism and its consequences on Indian politics during those critical decades between, say, 1920 and 1947. One of the main themes of Indian political history of this period is, of course, the rise of Gandhian nationalism, Gandhi's emergence in Indian politics and the transformation it brought about in Indian political life. But alongside, you also run into the less palatable dimension of how Muslim League itself was also undergoing the similar kind of transformation, acquiring a mass base and finally succeeding on the basis of that mass base in achieving the demand for Pakistan, which certainly, as you know, came as a major setback to the composite nationalism that the Indian National Congress represented. Within the Congress, we come across the rise of the left, the interplay of new ideas, Marxism and socialism began to exercise a considerable ideological influence on not merely the communists but also among congressmen. Uh, and the rise of the left certainly with its implications for a different kind of socialist vision about national reconstruction forms an important chapter in this story. And lastly, decolonization also has emerged as an important concern among historians, partly because of the reason that you can actually trace the roots of some of the decolonizing measures from 1930s onwards back to the reforms that the government, the colonial state, had already introduced. So there, of course, were certain immediate factors which hastened the process of decolonization, but then decolonization with one in, in one sense was a response to the kind of pressure that mass nationalism had been able to exert on the colonial state. One might always say that British did not wish to withdraw from India, but they did it under compulsion, and that came from the tremendous pressure on the colonial state borne upon by a substantial enlargement of the scope of in the scope of the national movement during the Gandhian era. The point of entry, if we may choose it, uh, is of course the rise of mass nationalism, the rise of Mahatma Gandhi in Indian politics. He came from South Africa, he started organizing local movements in Champaran and then in Kera, uh, mobilizing workers in Ahmedabad, uh, so, Congress, uh, which came to be influenced by the ideal of Satyagraha and which basically was an attempt to mobilize the ordinary people in the, and bringing them into the mainstream national politics, this was certainly an important turning point in Congress politics, in national, pol in Indian politics, so to say. And uh, Gandhi's uh, emergence, to a large extent, was accompanied by the rise of a new generation of political leaders who are willing to play the role of Gandhi's supporters or Gandhi's agents, Gandhi's uh, people who were providing the local leadership to the Gandhian movement. Sir, yes? sir, who were these people and how did they manage to achieve prominence in Indian politics? Take, for example, the case of Rajendra Prasad. Rajendra Prasad was a Bihar lawyer. In the course of the Champaran Satyagraha, Rajendra Prasad actually emerged as one of the local uh, leaders on whom Gandhi came to rely heavily. Go to Gujarat, you come across the rise of Ballabhai Patel as the preeminent leading personality in the Congress in the province of Gujarat. And Patel's uh, emergence in national politics was in connection with his involvement in Khera Shuttagra. In uh, Champaran or in Khera, we come across such local leaders who were actually supporting, propping up a new leadership structure. Jaharlal Nehru, to take another example, was actually going around the United Provinces countryside to get a clear sense of peasant life, eventually to emerge as a leader of the peasants.
So this new generation of leaders certainly provided the real manpower in Gandhi's army, who took initiative in uh, organizing uh, local satyagrahs. And finally, in 1921, as you know, the non-cooperation movement attempted satyagraha on a much grander scale. But the rise of the new generation of leaders also was related to the rise of new regions, something which David Lowe, the famous Australian historian, describes as the rise of submerged regions in Indian politics, which is associated with the shift of the center of gravity of Congress politics from the maritime cities, Madras, Bombay, and Calcutta, to the North Indian heartland. This is a very significant change happening in Indian politics after 1919, after the rise of Gandhi, after Gandhi's attempt to reorient the Congress towards large-scale popular movements, particularly peasant movements in an agrarian country like India, and in the process bringing about a change in the character of the Congress. Rise of submerged regions, rise of new generation of political leaders, and all this was possible because of this third factor concerning the development of the Congress as a mass organization. And this development of the Congress as a mass organization had great implications for Indian politics. Sir, what was the impact of this phenomenon of mass organization in Congress politics itself? Yes, the Congress became a regular affair in the first place. It was no longer looked upon as an annual meeting. The Congress uh, now would have a regular program uh, spreading into the uh, countryside, a program which would be decided upon by higher echelons of the leadership and carried out in the rural areas or in the uh, by the local branches of the organization. So you have a very interesting piece written in the 1960s by Gopal Krishna, a, a historian of great eminence, uh, regarding the development of the Congress as a mass organization, suggesting how in this phase, through such movements uh, like the early Satyagrahas and then followed up by some of the large scale mass movements on an all India scale, the Congress gradually acquired a mass organization which would link when organizations at the remotest level, at the bottommost level with the higher echelons of the leadership. In other words, the Congress created a chain of command and this chain of command would flow from the high command at the center and would relate downwards to the bottommost level. And in those local organizations, which had important presence in the blocks, in the taluks, in the villages, you have a large number of local organizations of the Congress who would keep the Congress flag alive, who would keep the Congress organization alive, even when the Congress was not actually organizing any massive movements. The emergence of the mass organization of, of, in this sense introduced an entirely new dimension to Congress politics. Secondly, and this is also something to do with the development of the Congress as a mass organization, the relationship between the local organizations and the central leadership increasingly came to be determined by the overall calculations of the central leadership about the utility of agitations. It is suggested often that because of this larger concern which the higher echelons of the Congress leadership had to consider in organizing movements against imperial rule, they often acted as a kind of a restraining factor on the natural militancy of the people at the local level. What mass nationalism was, was basically peasant nationalism, because I have already indicated that in a country like India, the bulk of the people were peasants and Peasant nationalism eventually came to be studied as mass nationalism. And there were occasions when peasants actually showed an element of radicalism, an element of militancy, which had to be restrained by the Congress by calculating on the possible risks 
which were associated with the unrestrained militancy of the peasantry. So you have seen how at Chauri Chaura, the Gandhian leadership, Gandhi himself, had to restrain this kind of outbreak of militant action. So this has been the story of the Congress. There has been always this oscillation between organizing movements and at times restraining these movements. And the relationship between the peasant following, who constituted the mass organization, and the central leadership has emerged as one of the main themes of research and discussion by historians in recent years, thanks to the contribution of the subaltern historiography to the analysis of mass nationalism. The subaltern historiography often tried to make the point that mass nationalism had this very unfortunate dimension of the central leadership trying always to restrain the natural militancy of the popular following. At this point, it is important to note that this chain of command gave the Congress the character of a potential state. Gandhi Maharaj was a kind of an honorific that the followers used for their leader, but Gandhi Maharaj is, I think, more symbolical because Gandhi Maharaj represented the alternative state that the Congress actually began to represent once it had been able to forge such a close connection with the countryside. So much so that during 1942, when the last major movement was organized by the Congress, the Congress rebels in the countryside in 1942 looked like a prati sarkar, an alternative government. We would come across um, this kind of an alternative government in most of the major centers of uh, uh, 1942 movement. You would come across such things in Midnapur, in uh, Balia, in uh, Maharashtra, wherever Quit India movement achieved a great deal of intensity. It is also true that Quit India movement actually didn't spread into wider areas, unlike the earlier movements. They were, it was concentrated in small pockets, but in those pockets where the Quit India movement acquired this high level of intensity, one comes across the emergence of a kind of an alternative government provided by the Congress rebels in the countryside. So that is where you can see the implications of the emergence of the mass organization on not just on Congress politics, but on Indian politics as a whole. Now, during the 1930s, as we were saying, certain new trends began to be noticed. And this had something to do with the impact of left-wing ideas on Indian political life, the impact of communism, the impact of Marxism. By then, the Communist Party of India has been formed, and uh, in the labor front, the communists were fairly active, stood communist initiatives. Even though the communists in India hadn't yet tried to mobilize the peasants, but even then, you will come across in the 1940s how the communists uh, firmly anchored in the labor constituencies in the urban areas would now seek to move into the countryside by mobilizing the peasants. In Bengal, you have this famous Tebhaga movement. Even Andhra, you have the Telangana mobilization on the eve of independence. So Marxism and communism, of course, emerged as a very important new ideological factor, so to say, in Indian political life, accounting for the rise of the left in Indian politics. And also, you see similar developments within the Congress itself. The Congress also had begun to undergo similar changes. Excuse me, sir. What is this United Front strategy? This United Front strategy comes in connection with the participation or the involvement of the communists in the mainstream of the national movement. After the First World War, uh, the Comintern had actually given directives to communists elsewhere in the world to function close touch or to collaborate with the mainstream nationalists in order to resist fascism and also uh, for the sake of achieving freedom from colonial rule. So this United Front strategy actually had different implications in different contexts, but this whole idea of popular front entailed a certain vision of a close relationship with the mainstream nationalists and the left wing and the communists. 
the impact of this was seen in the formation of the Congress Socialist Party. The Congress Socialist Party, once again formed during the 1930s, included a fairly good number of very prominent communists of that, of that time. Nambudripat was one of them. The Nambudripat became a leading figure in the communist movement in India, and Nambudripat achieved national eminence as a member of the Congress Socialist Party, which functioned within the Congress, but which represented the left-wing uh, element in the Congress. And these left in the Congress looked upon people like Jawaharlal Nehru or Subhash Chandra Bose as their leaders. They represented the aspirations of the left in the Congress. And the implications of uh, the rise of the left in the Congress required to be studied against the larger backdrop of mobilization and unionization of labor on the one hand. But at the same time, the rise of the left actually made for a different kind of vision about national reconstruction. So in 1937, when in the Haripura Congress, in which Shubhash Bose was elected president, the decision was taken to form the National Planning Committee in which experts uh, in economic life or economic experts, labor leaders uh, were all assembled together to chart out the vision for a planned economy in independent India. In Nehru was a very key man in this National Planning Committee. So this National Planning, Planning Committee in a way anticipated the kind of planned economy that Nehruian state after independence act actually wanted to develop. And the National Planning Committee in a sense actually demonstrated clearly the kind of impact that socialist ideas were making in Congress politics. And the socialism of course doesn't mean and, uh, only Marxism. You have other groups of socialists who are not communist but who certainly had a kind of socialist vision. During the 1930s, you also come across the larger participation of women in political life. Uh, civil disobedience is always counted as a major advance on non-cooperation because of the greater involvement of women and students. This was also the period when large-scale organization of the students was emerging with the formation of All India Student Federation. And before that, you have provincial level student bodies like All Bengal Students Association in Bengal. So involvement of the students, involvement of larger number of women in nationalism, the greater in unionization and mobilization of labor, an element of left-wing ideological influence in the Congress, all these would actually count as important features in the politics of the 1930s. One important manifestation of this substantial enlargement in the scope of the national movement was the All India State People's Movements. And this had to, something to do with the extension of nationalist mobilization and nationalist activity among the princely states of India, which had hitherto remained to a large extent untouched by the nationalist movement. This also would be taken as an important uh, development of the 1930s. But all these are partly related to the emergence of mass nationalism. As you look at the other side of this mass politics, to the story of how Muslim League, following the same strategy, undergoing the same transformation, was also able to organize the Muslim masses in its favor and succeeded in drawing upon this mass support in backing up their demand for Pakistan. The 1940, in the Muslim annual session at Lahore, the demand for Pakistan was raised. And if you look at the politics of the Muslim League during the decade of the 1940s, you will come across a similar process as work. Whereas in the earlier phase, the Muslim League leadership was concentrated largely in northern India among the very small North Indian elite. In the age of mass nationalism, it began to extend its influence among the Muslim majority provinces in Punjab and Bengal. And this brought about a significant transformation in Muslim League politics as well. It is not as if that the, it was a smooth sailing history because there were regional organizations who represented the rural classes in the Punjab and Bengal, 
you have the unionist party in the Punjab, you have the Krishak Praja party in Bengal. These two parties actually represented peasant interest to some extent or landowners interest as the unionist party did in the Punjab. But in both instances, we find the Muslim League actually taking the wind out of their sail by actually aligning with these rural classes. In Bengal, for example, the Muslim League began to sell the radical rhetoric by promising to the peasants a relatively free and emancipated world by giving them a certain degree of independence and autonomy from the control of the landlords and the Hindu landlords and moneylenders to which they had been hitherto subjected. So the Muslim League was able to promise to them a certain freedom that the earlier organization of the peasants did, but it moved, it managed to um, blend this emancipatory radical vision with a communal vision. And if you trace the history of communal mobilization from 1920s onwards, you would also come across as Suranjan Das, the historian of communal riots of Bengal has suggested, the greater politicization of the communal riots. I mean, the, the more the Muslim League influence began to extend among the masses, the greater was the propensity towards communal riots. Even though unionization or mobilization of labor might have acted as an antidote to communal mobilization, but during the 40s, at least for some time, as the direct action riot of 1946 demonstrated, reason actually took the back seat and communal frenzy was at rampage. This was the larger context in which the colonial state decided on decolonization. And decolonization certainly emerges as another important theme in historical discussion of this period between 1919 and 1947. Now, decolonization may imply that the colonial state was actually out of its own will committed to devolve powers among Indians and ultimately trying to live up to their commitment of giving India independence. That was certainly not the case, contrary to some of the historians with a certain imperial vision who had argued that the British were committed to decolonization from the very beginning of their rule in India. Decolonization was a kind of a conditioned response of the imperial rulers to the massive pressure that Indian political agitation had begun to exert on them from 1920s onwards. So decolonization, if, it were, if there was any conscious move to, towards decolonization at all, was a kind of a response to the massive pressure that they were facing. Uh, and um, one important dimension of this history of decolonization, of course, is the reforms that came one after another from 1909 onwards. Uh, in 1909, you have a limited amount of devolution of power. 1919, you have diarchy. In 1935, you have provincial ministries taking over the responsibility of some of the major departments. And in 1947, you have the Indian Independence Act. And there is always this temptation of drawing a straight line from 1909 to 1947 to tell the history of, uh, from the British side of a conscious commitment to decolonization. But as I was arguing, that decolonization also was, apart from being a response to the Indian political agitation, being a part of the strategy to cling to the empire when retaining the empire had become an almost an impossible proposition, decolonization ha had also so something to do with some of the fundamental points of difficulties, points of crisis in the empire. One of these was the manpower crisis in the empire. Excuse me, sir. What was the nature of this manpower crisis and what was its relation with the decolonization? You know, the manpower crisis, simply put, is the refusal or the reluctance on the part of the British young men to come to India and serve the Indian Empire. Unlike in an earlier phase when Indian service always attracted them. So in the context of these large-scale movements of the 1920s and 1930s, serving in India became an unattractive proposition. So there are arguments which suggest that the British Empire was already facing a manpower crisis from the 1930s onwards when young men from England were no longer so willing 
to come to India and serve the empire. This manpower crisis would acquire a magnified form on the eve of independence when the Indian National Army had virtually revolted against the British in certain areas. The INA of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose actually exposed the weaknesses of an army which was uh, largely Indian and the British became somewhat uncertain about the loyalty of the armed forces. The RIN mutiny, the naval mutiny in 1946 once again in Bombay after the Second World War was another indication of how the British had become uncertain about the kind of support that they had earlier received from the armed forces, largely Indian in composition. The British Empire was facing a major financial crisis as well. Uh, maintaining an empire was becoming financially non-viable and so a, a, a good deal of autonomy had to be given to the Indian government so that the uh, taxes imposed on British imports kept on increasing to a point where Lancashire interests lost their most lucrative market in the world. So financially this was becoming a problematic. Uh, manpower crisis was one factor which the imperial rulers had to reckon with. And then you have this large scale agitation lurking at the background which set the stage for the British to quit India. But when they decided to quit India, they took advantage of this communal mobilization, this communal frenzy, the increasing scale of riots, ultimately to accede to the demand for Pakistan by dividing it. And partition of the country emerges as the last tragic finale for the story of an otherwise very impressive kind where we have seen how imperialism began to falter, began to lose its grounds in the face of this massive pressure of mass nationalism.